Hey everyone, welcome to week 17, day five. This is our last day on our uh, one brush uh, per painting challenge exercise thing. Uh, so we've used uh, round bristle, we've used long flat synthetic, we've used silver falcon. Como hace silver falcon, Danny? Como es? Silver falcon! <laughs> so We've used a uh, silver falcon. Uh, we've used a mongoose um, round. Very nice. It was tough to paint yesterday though, but that's a very nice brush. And for today, we're gonna use a round uh, sable. A small round sable, size 12 condor. I think they're Brazilian. So uh, I think that's a nice array of brushes. What have we learned this week? that if we had to paint with just one brush, we can do it, we can paint with one brush. There's no problem, there's nothing wrong if you wanna go about it that way. Uh, it is challenging, but you know, you could do it. And it doesn't have to be expensive, it could be cheap. All you have to do is keep it clean by wiping it, and that's about it. I'll see you next week, bye. Okay, let's get started. Now for today, like I said yesterday, I had every intention of using solely my sable brush, my Kalinsky sable, red sable brush. But what I noticed the moment I started using the brush and putting paint down is that it really does behave quite similarly to uh, my mongoose brush. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Not all um, natural hair brushes behave exactly the same. Some are actually a little too soft, and those that are a little on the softer side, I don't really use that much because I'm more of a rougher painter. I like uh, grittier paintings. So I think that a brush that is really designed and built to be soft and to be delicate, it would be absurd for me to use those sort of brushes. They, they would be completely lost on me. So it would be a waste of money for me. And honestly, in my paintings, you wouldn't be able to see the brush shine and to see what the brush actually can do. Once I started painting and putting paint down, mind you, this is not a painting that is done indirectly. We're not going to do layers of paint. Uh, we're not going to glaze. We're not using any medium. So uh, a lot of the use of this brush is actually quite, quite limited by those factors that are decisions, conscious decisions that I've made for my painting. So I already know this. I already know that what I'm getting is actually maybe a small percentage of what a brush can actually do, but I'm fine with that. I like having that small percentage of possibilities and saying, okay, that's what I have to deal with. Uh, let's try to push this and let's see how much I can get out of them. So there is a difference between yesterday's brush and today. And I guess it has to be the hair length because I was thinking about it. And in terms of, of the body, in terms of the, the softness of the brush, they are quite similar. Mm, I think you can get a tip that, even though it's a pointed tip, and you can do this with both of them, I mean, some of the most beautiful watercolor brushes, like let's say a, a Winsor Newton Series 7 brush, comes to like a ridiculously fine point. So, and those are sable brushes. So sable can obviously have the ability to get to a very, very fine tip. But I'm trying to describe the, uh, the tip it does get to a point, but it's also a little bit irregular. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm pretty sure that people that have used those brushes know exactly what I'm talking about. It actually comes to a tip and then it very softly kind of splays as soon as you start doing your brush stroke. So the uh, brush kind of opens up and it, it becomes uh, beautifully and organically irregular. And I, I guess that's the most beautiful aspect of any one of these natural hair brushes. It's just that it feels perfectly random in a way uh, that you can control it, but it's still a brush. So your painting is never gonna try to hide the fact that it is indeed a painting. It's gonna showcase those brush strokes beautifully. So what I was saying about the length of hair is that I feel the, the mongoose brush actually has a little bit of a longer body and because it is a little bit longer, it just deposits paint. It just applies paint a little bit differently. In terms of how much paint it actually can grab from the palette and how delicate it is when you put it on top of your surface, I think they are a little bit similar. 
Again, they're not the same. That's why these two brushes exist, because they are quite different. But I do think that in my hand, again, I should preface this always because I am sure that in more capable hands, in painters that have a vast experience when dealing with these brushes, they're probably able to get so much more than what I'm able to get. But in my hands, they just feel the same. And this is the only thing that I can do. I can only share with you guys what I think makes sense for my painting and for my own sensibility. So it's not like I can turn on a switch and say, okay, now I'm gonna do a Bouguereau and then tomorrow I'm gonna do a uh, Francis Bacon. It just doesn't work that way. So I think that I can only get, you know, a very small percentage of what these brushes can do. And I think I was realizing that very, very quickly when I started applying paint on the surface. And I was like, oh God, this is gonna be an experience that is far too similar than the one that I had yesterday. So even though this is a one brush challenge, I mean, I am technically not cheating, but you know, let's face it, I am cheating. I brought another tool into the uh, painting of this image and it's a palette knife. And usually people are always equating palette knives with just these very impasto -y strokes that you put down and you kind of respect the sculptural quality of those strokes. And honestly, I actually don't use my uh, palette knives for that. Have I used them for that? Of course, absolutely. I mean, it is uh, glorious when you can put down a palette knife stroke or when you can just lay in a background or a large area of a painting with a knife, just having the confidence that you've mixed, you know, the exact color that you want and you want that color to occupy a really large area of the painting. There's nothing quite like it. It's, it's quite beautiful. But I've always noticed that I like what my knife can do as long as it's being accompanied by brush strokes. I don't like it by itself. I mean, you can do a painting with just a palette knife. That is absolutely obvious. But I really think that the underlying lesson throughout all this week has been that I've recognized that we have the ability to do it. Nothing is stopping us from just using one brush. But if we kind of pull all these brushes together and we say, okay, you guys are gonna be my team and I recognize what each of them can do and can provide for me uh, when I'm trying to express something in a painting, and I can call upon them when I know exactly what brush and what stroke is gonna fit that intention when I'm trying to translate, to transcribe my perception into paint, when I can do that, when I can tell my brushes, yeah, I need you for this area and you for this detail and you for this kind of drawn mark, then oof, I'm using like the power of all these incredible tools and I put them together and hopefully by putting them together, they are stronger than when they are by themselves. So if it came down to it, yeah, we can paint with one brush. There's absolutely no issue about that. We've examined the fact that there are qualities to those brushes that we need to deal with. There is a character to them, the way they pick up paint from your palette, the way they lay paint down, the shape of that stroke, the size of them, the fact that we understand where the brushes come from. Yesterday I did a ton of soul searching and I realized, yeah, what I can do, and I think it's a small step, but I think it's a step in the right direction, and I think we could all take this step. I'm not gonna force anyone to do anything. That's not who I am. But what I think we could do is just say, you know what, I'm not gonna buy any more of these. I've bought these in the past. It's not a mistake. It's, you know, this is part of our tradition. I would be very, very happy in trying to find alternatives to soft hair brushes and to uh, bristle brushes. I think those are way tougher to reproduce. There's nothing quite like a bristle brush stroke, like the marks that they leave behind. And thinking about those marks that a brush leaves behind, what I ended up doing with my palette knife was really basically nullifying the sort of DNA of that brushstroke when I scrape it. So a brushstroke is beautiful in the manner in which it deposits paint, right? And it leaves its mark when it deposits paint. That's what's gorgeous about a brushstroke. So when you take a knife and you just kind of scrape all that superficial, beautiful layer of paint, all you get is just kind of like a tinted ground. But I started noticing that I really liked the play between my brush strokes and my scraped color, where 
all this light from the beautiful white ground which shine through and it just gives this gorgeous brightness to the color that I've already mentioned before that I can't really access through anything else, right? I cannot compete with that when I put opaque paint down. So I've already noticed this about the uh, little pieces of linen that I'm using, and I'm really, really liking that quality. But I started to think, ah, am I being kind of lazy if I'm putting paint down and scraping it off? Like, am I being non-committal to my brush strokes? I'm trying to put color down, and I'm trying to put shapes of color down with my tools, you know, with my brushes. But then I'm sort of going back so I take like one step forward two steps back I realized hell no you know all of this is painting all of it so painting has a wide variety of brushes and those are our tools but it doesn't mean that those are the only tools we can have when trying to express and it got my mind thinking in in two separate directions and I'm gonna try to tie these two together because I think it's quite cool very quickly I realized okay I can actually balance the fact that I'm scraping paint by having some of the areas in the painting being open, like unfinished. And again, it's also running the risk of being lazy, of saying like, yeah, I'm not gonna paint that. I think it looks nice, just kind of hinted. And I remember that show that was at the Met a couple of years ago, uh, the Unfinished show, where they had uh, beautiful Freuds. There's gonna be some examples here of the Freuds that I think are quite fascinating. And the reason I, I absolutely love the Freuds um, is the fact that he many times has hints of a drawing, you know, in the underlayer. And you would think he would respect those drawings, like he would follow his own drawing, but he didn't. And I think it has to do with the manner in which he paints because he was so laser focused on describing very specific details right from the beginning that when you think about the part, inevitably you're gonna lose a sense of the whole. So almost always he was never able to follow the uh, proportions of the drawings he had already set for himself. <laughs> Even though he would argue that maybe some of these were just failures or abandoned or just initial attempts that didn't work out or he lost interest in some way, I don't think that that can rob me from saying, wow, I love them as they are. No, because when we do things, and we have to understand that as, as artists, that socializer work, as soon as we are done with something, they don't belong to us anymore. They really don't. Um, they belong to everyone that is actually seeing them and, and having experiences while observing those paintings. Our paintings and, and the experiences, the emotions that can spur from them don't belong to us. Those belong to every single human being out there. And if they serve as the catalyst for somebody's imagination just going absolutely wild, then even these, quote unquote, again, unfinished or abandoned works prove to be absolutely essential for this person that saw in them possibility. So my mind was obviously transported to those places where a painting can be very little. It can willingly be what other people would consider a lesser painting or a lesser effort, and yet they can be magical. They can be absolutely magical and fresh and just full of liveliness because it's almost like if you were catching a painting in mid-sentence and just all that energy is just bottled up. It's built up there because there is no resolution, yet like you're caught in the middle of a problem. And I love that. It's almost like my mind is just uh, bouncing off the walls of this painting. And like I said, I'm gonna try to connect uh, all these thoughts. But when I thought about Freud, and this is how my mind works, so forgive me, but again, you know, my mind goes like a thousand miles an hour. So when I thought about Freud, I thought about early Freud. And the latter Freud is the one that almost everyone kind of knows, which is opaque paint over opaque paint and just like plop paint on top of paint on top of paint on top of paint. And it's very, very sculptural. And, you know, painting just juts out of the canvas like an inch or, you know, two inches. It's crazy. You know, that's a Freud. But early Freud, uh, which almost feels like egg tempera, is freaking incredible. And there's some paintings, and, and there's this one in particular, where you can actually see the trailing of the hairs during the brush stroke. And those spaces, those little scratch marks that the brush does on the surface 
are actually doing the same thing that I'm doing with my palette knife. They are letting all this little bit of air shine through, kind of filter through the paint. And it's amazing. It's absolutely incredible because there's a glimmering of the color because of all that lightness filtering through. So I absolutely love that. And I realized, wow, this, this goes kind of against what I've known. And, you know, I talked about this in another painting session about the fact that light is usually expressed by opaque paint. But I really, really love when that ground is coming through in the light areas. And then, boof, my mind went immediately to, once again, illustration. Like I always say, I am an illustrator at heart. So my mind immediately went to uh, Bernie Fuchs. Because, you know, in traditional painting, yes, our shadows are transparent. But with Bernie Fuchs, he was like, no, shadows are going to be transparent. And I'm going to mass in my shadows. And that's going to be incredible. But I'm also going to wipe out my lights. So what you have is this really kind of amazing paint layer where light and shadow physically feel the same way. And yet Fuchs developed this technique where he had this insane ability to just by wiping out and then applying little bits of color, create this idea of brightness and just this beaming lightness. And I was like, wow, there's no law, there's no rule to tell you how paint should be applied and how light should be described. There is none. You know, it is all a matter of choice and it's all a matter of trying to do whatever works for your painting. So I found solace in Bernie Fuchs. He is one of the best illustrators, I think, in the latter half of the uh, 20th century. For sure, his compositions are amazing. His skills at just putting shapes together and creating rhythms through shapes. Oh my God, it is absolutely incredible. My mind went to unfinished versus kind of abandoned paintings, just trying to get a sense of comfort when I left all those open areas and feeling that a quote unquote unfinished painting is not a lesser painting. It can actually be a very, very powerful image charged with a ton of energy. It's encapsulated energy and how the moments that can breathe through the painting, be it light or shadow, can be magically melded together when there's an idea of an overall overarching sense of light and atmosphere embracing the whole of the picture. So that's what we did today. We started off with a brush. I realized it was looking and feeling a little bit too much like what we did yesterday. So instead of making a painting that felt iterative, I realized, okay, let's bring another tool in and let's change things up a little bit and let's try to find possibilities in my painting and try to make the best out of them. So the lesson, like I said, throughout this week is that these tools, when they're together, they are insanely strong and powerful. And I was very happy uh, throughout this week. I'm super, super stoked when I can really feel like I'm working with you guys because what I understand as a theme during the week also becomes like an incredibly deep learning experience for me. And I really, really felt that this week. So I love that I put myself in those uh, positions because usually we shy away from those and we try to... <laughs> to just stick with what we know. But uh, this, uh, this whole project has just been an excuse to do all these fun exercises for me. And I obviously think that it's getting me closer and closer to the way I understand the world, which is through paint. So uh, that was an awesome week for me. Remember, next week, whole new theme. Danny and I, super grateful. Every Friday, we tell you guys, we're super, super grateful that you gave us a chance to hang out with you guys during the week. So we'll see you guys next week. Thank you once again. Bye.